Well, good morning, guys. We're missing a... You're really tired? <laughs> Pardon? You stayed up till 10 o'clock? Wow, that's very late. You might need a nap this afternoon. <laughs> well, it's good to see you here. We're missing a lot of our friends, so hopefully we have them back with us next week. I... Uh, I'm glad to be here, and I have a question for you. Do you know what a riddle is? Yep, no, my dad's asked me. Your dad's asked you one? Good. So you will know what this is. A riddle is really a word puzzle. So you kind of figure it out in your head, all right? So I made up a riddle for you this week. I think it's pretty good. So um, see if you can figure out my riddle. All right? This week, Reverend Bob and I bought something. In fact, we bought a lot of them. All right? And if you come to our house and look in, look inside, you will not see them in the living room, the dining room, the kitchen. You won't see them inside the bathroom or the bedrooms. You won't see them anywhere in our house. And if you go in and you look out, you won't see them out in the yard or the driveway. What did we buy? Ice cubes. Binoculars? No. Nope. Yeah. A new car? No. Nope. Remember, we bought several of them. <laughs> Anybody? If you look in, you won't see them inside. If you go in and look out, you won't see them outside. What did we buy? Oh, me. Ah! Oh, somebody over there figured out my riddle. Did you hear what she said? Yeah. What'd she say? Windows. Windows. They're not inside the house. They're not out in the driveway or the yard. They're part of the house. We bought new windows. We needed new windows. Our old ones were very old. And when you tried to open them, it was like, eh, eh. These ones are just, ooh, and ooh, so nice. And so we have been thinking a lot about windows this week. We've been touching them and cleaning them and taking pictures of them, and sometimes we just stand and stare at them because we like our new windows so much. But with all this talking and thinking about windows, I've had a song running through my head all week. And it's a song that I used to sing in Sunday school when I was much younger. And it says, the windows of heaven are open. God's blessings are falling tonight. And so I've been singing that in my head all week, at work, at home, when I'm out walking the dog, all week that little song has been running through my head. And so about halfway through the week, I started to get this picture in my head when I was singing. And, you know, I don't really know what heaven looks like. I don't know what God looks like, but I have a picture in my head. And so all week I've been imagining God opening up a window and having a big bucket of blessings and throwing it out on top of me. Now, for you to understand how great this picture is, you have to know what a blessing is. And a blessing is really God's special gift. It's his support, his protection, his, um, his wonderfulness, his goodness on me. And so if you can imagine, the windows of heaven are open. So imagine God throwing open a window, and he has a big bucket of goodness that has Grace's name on it. And he reaches out, and he just throws it down on her. Isn't that an amazing picture to have? God's window of blessing is open, and he's throwing down his support, his goodness, his protection, his special gifts on you. You want to think about God? You want to have um, some goodness in your life, some richness in your life? Just imagine God opening the window of heaven and throwing out a big bucket of blessing on your head. That's what getting new windows taught me this week or reminded me of. I think it was a pretty special week. Let's talk to God. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being um, a great, big, wonderful God who cares about us enough 
to give us your support, your blessing, your special gifts, and your protection. Thank you, God, for the blessings that you throw down on us daily. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for the boys and girls that are here. Thank you for the blessings that you've already put on their life and those that are yet to come. Father, we ask that when they're in Sunday school uh, today, that they will learn the lesson that you want them to learn, and we ask that uh, you pour down your blessing on their teacher as well. And now, Father, we ask that you bless these little boys and girls and the homes they represent. In Jesus' name, I pray this. Amen. Sarah, we, we need to talk. This sounds really serious. It is. Maybe you should put on some tea. That serious? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Yes, dear. Well? Uh, we have a good life here, Sarah. This is our home. I've even lost my place. <laughs> <laughs> it's the home of our fathers and mothers. We live here with our relatives, and I think we are happy. Yes, and? And God is telling us to leave. No, no. Why would God tell us to leave? And how do you know God is telling you this? I heard God in here. God promised to show us a land where we could live to make a great nation of us. I know it sounds crazy, but I know it was God. Is that all God said? Just leave for wherever and we will become a great nation? Uh, God said, I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and one who curses you, I will curse him, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God said that to you? Yeah, I know, it's pretty hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe God doesn't know you as well as I do. Uh, I don't understand it either. Why me? <laughs> Why us? But I know it. As sure as I'm stand sitting here, <laughs> as sure as my love for you, this is what we're supposed to do. Abram, you are my husband, and if you know God is calling us to leave, then so be it. Where you go, I will go. We will now go. <laughs> Thank you, Abram and Sarah, for uh, that little insight. And uh, we, as we have are walking through um, the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, we have arrived at um, Abram's story, the story of Abraham. And we began last week with this um, little incident entitled, When God Calls. Um, God calling Abraham to go to a place where he didn't know where he was going. He didn't know what was going to be there when he got there. He didn't know why he was going. And he didn't really know what he was going to find when he got there or what he was supposed to do when he got there. But we said that faith is trusting and obeying when it doesn't make sense. Faith is trusting and obeying when you don't know the where and the when and the why and the what for. Faith is trusting and obeying when we're not in the know. But what we do know is that God knows what he's up to and we trust him. And that's in Abraham. And so Abraham and Sarah pick up with their belongings and their closest family and off they go. And we pick up the story halfway through Genesis chapter 12. Let me read for you verses 10 through 20. Now there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman. When Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. 
He treated Abram well for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants and maid servants and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious disease on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Thus endeth the reading of God's word. Over the course of life, we have many tests, don't we? They begin when we're young. All right, Johnny, what's two plus two? They continue through our teen years. See if you can park, parallel park this car, Jonathan. And they don't stop when you get old. John, let's wait for the lab tests before we make a decision. Tests will always be a part of life. But no matter how many tests you take, there's always a certain amount of stress associated with them, isn't there? It's called test anxiety. And test anxiety is usually associated with the fear of failing a test. There's an actual word for it. Did you know that? Testophobia. Testophobia, the fear of taking tests. Many people have experienced this feeling. There are some people who are very smart, very intelligent in school, very good students. They learn well. They have a good grasp of the material. But they don't get good grades because they have this fear of tests. They sit down to take the test and their mind goes blank. They get panicky. They get sick in their stomach. The facts they knew just moments before are gone. And they end up failing the tests. I don't much like failing the tests. Do you? Can you remember the first test you ever failed? Or maybe perhaps the most painful or dramatic test, traumatic test you ever failed? I can't remember the first test I ever failed, but I do remember the one that hurt the most and was the most embarrassing. It was my first driving test. In typical guy fashion, I had broadcast it far and wide to my siblings and my friends that the event was about to happen. And how confident I was of passing and how sure of my superb driving skills I was. Several of my friends already had their license and several of them had to take the, tw the driving test twice. One of my, my buddies three times. Not me. I was going to be first time Bobby. My dad drove me to the testing place. Up West Street to the top of the hill, there's a little plaza there where the license bureau was in Aurelia. He was sure I was ready, so he left the car there with me and walked home. He had some other things to do and I would get to drive the car home by myself with my brand new license. In the car, driving instructor beside me, I'm very confident. I singled properly, left turn out of the parking lot, smoothly into my own lane on West Street, through the light, stop properly in front of the crosswalk. I'm good, real good. Down the street, down the hill, into the center of town. At the bottom of the hill, two minutes, barely, into my driving test, the instructor says calmly, Robert, you want to turn right at the next street, circle around and head back to the license plate. I'm thinking, man, I'm so good, I've already passed. <laughs> I looked at him and he said, see that sign over there, Robert? It says 30 miles per hour. Do you know what you were doing coming down that hill? 42 miles an hour, about 70 kilometers. I have to fail you. What a sickening feeling as I dial the payphone. Uh, Dad, want to come and get me? I failed. Or can you imagine what it was like sitting around my supper table as my loving brothers and sisters <laughs> said things like, Hey, Bob, how'd your driving test go? Snicker, snicker. Or, Hey, Bob, can I have a ride to school tomorrow with you in the morning? Oh, I forgot. You failed. <laughs> or then have to walk to school the next morning and explain to my friends and eat crow. You see, I told them all that my dad was going to let me take the car the first day with a license. I do not like failing. But we all do, don't we? Sometimes we stumble. We're all human. We all make mistakes. We all fail tests. The important thing is to learn from our mistakes and be better the next time around. It all adds to building our character for the next big hurdle. Well, tests will always be a part of our life. But there are some tests that are more important than others. There are tests that reveal our faith. Last week we joined Abraham, 
So he began his journey of faith. He was asked by God to pack up, pull up stakes, and leave his country, his friends, his family, his way of life in Ur, and head off to a new country. He doesn't get told where he's going or what he'll find when he gets there. God just has a job for him to do, to develop or begin to develop a great nation from himself in this promised land, a nation from which would come God's promised Messiah. And we pick up Abraham's story in chapter 12, verse 10. Abraham's now left his home country of Ur. He's gone to Haran. He stays there several years until his father dies. He's now brought his new wife Sarah and his nephew Lot and all his servants and livestock and everything else. And he's moved into the promised land. The land that God had promised to his ancestors or his descendants land forever. But it's time for Abraham's first test of faith. And it doesn't turn out very well. In fact, he fails his first test. And I take a measure of comfort from that. Abraham was a great man, but he was not a perfect man. This great man of God occasionally had lapses in faith and stumbled just like you and I do sometimes. These seemingly great personalities in the Bible, like Abram, were human. He faced the same kind of tests and temptations that cause us to make choices that are sometimes less than faith-filled. But the fact that God still used Abraham in a significant way is encouraging to me. Here's the first thing we learn from Abraham's first test. God's purpose for my life is not to make me comfortable, but to build my character. Did you get that? God's purpose for my life is not to make me comfortable, but to build my character. Abraham arrives in the promised land, the land that God says, just go, leave everything, trust me, I'll take care of you. And he arrives, and almost immediately, things don't go well for Abraham. If you look at verse 6, a bunch of Canaanites inhabit the land that is supposed to be his. So Abraham has to live this nomadic life in tents. Verse 10, there's famine in the land. There's not enough food, it seems like, to exist on. Now, does this seem fair to you? I mean, Abraham makes this Herculean effort and sacrifice for God. He leaves this very comfortable and successful life in Ur. He travels across the country to some strange place. He does all the right things. Do you think God can make it a little easier for him? He arrives and finds Canaanites. That represents too many problems. He finds famine. That means too few resources. Too many problems, too few resources. That ever happened to you in your life? The assumption that most of us have as Christians is that if I have a clear sense that God is leading me to do something and I obey and keep doing the right things that everything should work out just great. And if it doesn't, maybe the decision wasn't from God. Did I make a mistake here, Abraham may be thinking. Did I get my wires crossed? But life isn't like that sometimes, is it? Take Job. Remember his story? His character is stellar. Blameless, upright, righteous, godly. Serving God as best as he knows how. And doing a pretty good job of it. Great father, doing all the right things. And he has this whole stretch of horrible things that happen to him. Or take the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 9 says, This man is my chosen instrument, this is God talking, to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. What's that about? Flogged, prison, shipwrecked, adversity of every imaginable kind. It seems like just because God leads you to do something, It doesn't mean that everything's going to work out the way you want it to or expect it to. Life isn't always fair. And for whatever reason, God allows pain and difficulty and hard times to touch our lives. James in the New Testament writes a letter to a group of first century Christians who are being persecuted. He introduces himself and then drops a bomb two verses in. He says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. How would, you like me, how would you like to get a letter like that? Hi, this is me. Got problems? Suck it up, buttercup. Yeah. Be happy. Huh? Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. My reaction would be to smack him and then rip up the letter and throw him out of my house. Consider it pure joy in sensitive clod. 
Here's the truth. Sometimes life tests our faith. And although God doesn't cause or send those tests, He does allow them. And His purpose in them is to develop and build my character and deepen my faith. James says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces some character building qualities. Here's the lines in your notes. Pain can be productive. Pressure produces. Suffering accomplishes. Tough tests have a value. Let me give you three character building, faith deepening qualities that come from life's tough tests. Life's tough tests, first of all, purify my faith. That's the first line in your notes. Somebody said Christians are like tea bags. You don't know what's inside them until you drop them in hot water. (laughs) Or somebody said Christians are like steel. When it's tested in the fire, it comes out stronger. It's just a fact of life. The easier life is, the softer we get. The tougher life is, the stronger we get. Abraham is a tough a hundred years ahead of him. God knows he needs some maturing and strengthening and toughening. Tests purify my faith. Tests fortify my patience. Testing times help develop staying power, endurance, and hanging tough. And thirdly, God's tests sanctify my character. Testing times develop maturity in my life. Have you ever noticed that when God wants us to teach us love, He puts us around unloving people. It's easy to love loving people. But if He needs to teach you love, He puts you around unloving people. When God wants to teach us joy, He allows us to go through some tragedy and sorrow. When God wants to teach us peace, He puts us in the middle of chaos. When God wants to teach us, teach us patience, He allows times of waiting. God's purpose in my life is not to make me comfortable but to deepen and strengthen my character. Here's lesson number two. The second part of Abraham's test has to do with his wife Sarah. And here's the principle. Whenever we take things into our own hands, we often make them worse for ourselves and for others. Whenever we take things into our own hands, we often make things worse for ourselves and for others. Because of the famine, Abraham heads down to Egypt. Sarah's a very beautiful woman. Abraham's concerned that when the Egyptian officials see her and her beauty, they will kill her and uh, take her to the palace for Abraham's harem. There was a law in those days called the fratriarchal law. A husband could be killed for his wife, but a brother could not be killed for his sister. Sounds strange, but it sort of makes sense. Think about it. If someone wants to marry Sarah, they would have to make arrangements with Abraham. If Abraham is Sarah's brother, no problem. You don't have to kill him to have her. But however, Abraham is Sarah's husband. And if you want her, you just do him in. And take her in as part of the harem. So Abraham's strategy is to tell a half-truth. Please say, you're my sister. And that's sort of a half-truth. In Genesis chapter 20, when he told this half-truth again, this time to a guy named Abimelech, he says, she is truly my sister. She's the daughter of my father but not the daughter of my mother. So what he said wasn't entirely wrong. It just wasn't exactly right. Do you know what a half-truth is? Do you know what a half-truth is? It's a half-lie. I mean, the other half of a half-truth has to be a lie, doesn't it? The story is told of a first-year university student. To please his father, he went out for track. He had very little athletic ability, but his father had been a good runner in his day at university. So his first race was a two-man race where he was running against the school's best runner, and of course, he was badly beaten. But he didn't want to disappoint his father, so he wrote home, and this is what he said. He said, Dad, you'll be happy to know I ran against Bill Williams, the best runner in the school. He came in next to last, and I came in second. (laughs) Now, is any of that not true? Huh? It's all true, but it's a truth that deceives and leaves the wrong impression, just like Abraham's. And we know what Abraham is doing. He's covering his back. But he's doing it at Sarah's expense. His strategy seems to work like a charm. Pharaoh's officials see Sarah. She's beautiful. They tell Pharaoh. He takes her into his palace. And Abraham is well compensated for his half-sister. But he's deceived Pharaoh and a whole lot more. 
Now, I don't know much about harems, so I looked up a little information this week. There's this book entitled Harem, The World Behind the Veil. The author writes, Many of the women in the harem died young. There are endless stories of brutal murders and poisonings. The sultan wasn't required to marry the servant girls who became a part of his property. The sultan's concubines were just considered as wives. He usually had four to eight. He would spend nights with a different woman in turn. And to prevent disputes among them, they kept a schedule. The sultan's failure to favor each wife with equal enthusiasm stirred up a great deal of anxiety and insecurity and evil jealousy. And so Sarah is added to this group to spare his own life. Nice guy, Abram. Abraham takes things into his own hands, sacrifices the well-being of his wife, and puts her in a terrible situation with great danger. Verse 17, the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with disease and sickness. Here's the principle. When we take things into our own hands, we make things worth for ourselves and for others. We endanger our own well-being and ultimately hurt ourselves and hurt others. Therefore, in your notes, honesty is always the best policy. Honesty is the only godly policy. Honesty is always the best policy. Honesty is the only godly policy. Well, Pharaoh's very upset when he finds out that Abraham has deceived him. Why did you do this? He asks. Now, it's interesting to note. When Abraham told this half lie, half truth a second time, to a man named Abimelech over in chapter 20. Abimelech asks him the same question. Why did you do this? And in that case, Abraham answered his question this way. Abraham said, because I said to myself, don't miss this, I told myself, there is no fear of God in this place. I told myself, God isn't here, so I need to take things into my own hands. Isn't that interesting? Why is it that when we are so prone to take matters into our own hands and scheme and manipulate and not wait for God to come through and work things out, why is that? We don't think God's around. Or God, we don't think God knows what He's doing. Or we think, I need to help God out. If God was doing what God is supposed to be doing, I wouldn't be in this mess with too many problems and too many resources. The truth is, God was always there when Abraham failed. Every time Abraham makes a mistake, God is there. God was there every time Isaac failed. God was there every time Jacob failed. God was there every time Moses failed. God was there every time Peter failed. God was there every time Paul failed. Take a look at that list. When you fail, what's going to happen? Is God going to abandon you? No. God is always going to be there to help you pick up the pieces and re-strengthen your life and put new faith in you. Principle number three. Sometimes God has to protect us and our reputation even when we don't protect ourselves. God disrupts Abraham's strategy because God wanted to protect Abraham. When asked how he would handle his 12-year-old daughter's future boyfriends, NBA Hall of Famer Charles Barkley once said, Well, I figure if I kill the first one, the word will get out to the rest. I used to say when Julie was young, I'm going to tell the boys when they start coming around my house, just remember, I do own a gun and I know how to use it. Abraham didn't do any of that. He put Sarah in a very difficult position and God had to step in and save her. Pharaoh can't understand Abraham's actions and frankly we can't either. And God's concern for Sarah's virtue is unbelievable in this day. Unheard of and an obvious intervention of God And it saved her life. And you know what? When we get into trouble and fail our faith tests, we should do two things. First, look to ourselves as the culprit who gets into trouble. Take personal responsibility for the mess we're in. Lord, I messed up. Abraham got himself into this trouble. Second, when we get into trouble, always look to God to be merciful and to help us. Abraham's story would be a very different story if it were not for the mercy and the intervention of God. Principle number four. Great personalities in the Bible like Abraham were human. I love the fact 
that God doesn't sugarcoat its heroes. We can relate to them a whole lot better. Let me read to you a quote from a book I read this week. The writer writes, If you're not involved in any service or ministry, what excuse have you been using? Abraham was old. Jacob was insecure. Leah was unattractive. Joseph was abused. Moses stuttered. Gideon was poor. Samson was codependent. Rahab was immoral. David had an affair and all kinds of family problems. Elijah was suicidal. Jeremiah was depressed. Jonah was reluctant. Naomi was a widow. John the Baptist was eccentric, to say the least. Peter was impulsive and hot-tempered. Martha worried a lot. The Samaritan woman had several failed marriages. Zacchaeus was unpopular. Thomas had doubts. Paul had poor health. And Timothy was timid. That's quite a variety of misfits. But God used each of them in his service. And he'll use you too if you stop making excuses. Great personalities in the Bible like Abraham were human. Just like you and I. Principle number five. See a test of faith as a time of learning. See a test of faith as a time of learning. What can we learn in a time of testing so that we don't fail all the time? What do we need to keep in mind to pass God's tests? What can we do to profit from our problems and help make them productive? Let me close by giving you five R's. I've borrowed these from a little article that Rick Warren wrote that I read several weeks ago. Five R's. The first R is the word rejoice. Here's what you can do to help keep from failing tests. Don't thank God for the problem, but thank God for being there with you and helping you through it and being able to bring good out of it. Rejoice. The second R is request. Ask for, pray for, strength and wisdom and understanding and patience and perseverance. Ask God to use the experience to purify you and to fortify you and to sanctify you. Usually our prayer is, Lord, get me out of here or get the problem out of here. But ask, request. The third R is the word relax. Trust God with the situation. Refuse to scheme and manipulate. Take your hands off and give God time to come through for you. Relax. Have some patience. The next R is the word remain. Keep doing the right things. Keep your faith. Keep faithful. Keep trusting and obeying. And then finally, receive. James wrote in chapter 1 verse 12, Blessed is the person who perseveres under trial because when they have stood the test they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love Him. God always rewards those who obey and trust Him. The old hymn says, we're going to sing it in a moment, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Well, failed a test lately? There will be frequent tests in our Christian lives. Some will go well and some won't. Like Abraham, we too will always be tempted to go to extremes, to take things into our own hands in solving our problems. Trouble always, always follows. Thirdly, God's patience and faithfulness continue no matter what our decision has been. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for um, the very practical and real way that you tell the stories of these great men and women in the Bible. You paint both the good side and the not so good side and because of that we can relate to them because we don't always get it right. But Father, I thank you that your love and grace doesn't depend upon our performance but upon your love and grace for us. Who you are, not who we are. But we do ask for your forgiveness for times when we haven't trusted you when we tried to take things into our own hands and manipulate and scheme and things haven't gone very well, would you help us to trust you more, to obey and to keep doing the right things even when it doesn't make sense. Build into our lives the quality of honesty and integrity. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. The united blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit 
Rest and remain with you now and forever. Amen.